Welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. We've got another great show for you today. We're coming off a very thrilling all-star Saturday night at Charlotte Motor Speedway. The Monster Energy Cup stars were set on go, and what a great race we saw. It started with the open, those thrilling finishes with Bubba Wallace getting a stage win and William Byron doing so as well. And then Kyle Larson getting the last spot into the Monster Energy All-Star Race. And wow, did he ever take advantage of that? Listen to this. On pit road, I told two or three people, and I don't remember if I said it on TV or not, but I said, I'm going to bet on guys that have a K in their name or they're Kyle Larson. Those were my picks. And I meant Kyle Busch. I meant Kevin Harvick. And I meant... Kurt Busch. Kurt come up a little short. He was my sentimental favorite because he's got monster energy on the side of his car. But man, were those other picks pretty much spot on. That was awesome racing, and I loved every minute of it. And I love every minute of the show we have today. Joining me, Fox Sports Shannon Spake. She's going to talk about her life, which is crazy. She's a mom of two beautiful twins, nine-year-olds, a loving wife. She also does Fox for NASCAR, does Fox for the NFL, And she's training for two half Ironmans this year. You're going to learn all about that. How does she do all this? We're going to find out right now. Green play, green play. Welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered, Shannon Spake. I really appreciate you joining me. You are welcome, my friend. I have so many things to tell you because this is my 14th podcast. Well, I'm honored. Well, I appreciate you coming, but this is so cool because... Of the previous 13, they're all race car drivers. Mm -hmm. So I was basically interviewing them, and I felt like I was in charge. You know, it's Mike. I'm asking the questions. I know their story. I mean, you can see the results. You know the struggles, the challenges. And then comes episode 14, and Shannon shows up. Mm -hmm. Now, I have known you for years. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you listening. You're doing a great job. And of, of knowing you for years, know your story. I know you have twins and a lovely husband and a, just a fun girl. But I have never interviewed someone that interviews people. So I'm really, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm really excited because I want to ask you questions, mm-hmm. but then I hope they inspire you to ask me questions so instead of it being like just me talking about you you can talk about me let's have a conversation yes it'll be conversational there you go why why in the world did you get married in ireland so i was just filling you in honestly my husband and i were sitting at a at a bar at a pub one night uh with his family uh his family is irish and my family is irish as well and uh we kind of just said to each other hey if we get married one day what do you think about doing it in ireland and Mm. this was early on we weren't even engaged yet and uh so we actually got engaged in italy and then married in ireland so we're both italian and irish and we kind of think it's cool that it kind of covered both of those bases so in 2006 we went to ireland to italy his mother is actually first generation. So we went to this small little town in Asergi, Italy, which is just about two hours outside of Rome, for their Feast of the Assumption, which is when they walk through the streets carrying the statue of Mary, and they do this whole thing. And he asked me to marry him while we were on that trip. And then about 18 months later, we got married in Ireland. Wow. Yeah, so we had 74 people go over to Ireland for our wedding. So it was quite the scene, and uh, it was – I mean, we, we of course we got pushback, right, people said don't do this we're not going to be able to make it but we did what we wanted to do which was have a really kind of significant and and memorable uh marriage and and so we did what we wanted to do well that is a great story i'm i'm I'm, i appreciate that spirit where'd you get married i got married in cornelius so (laughs) where in cornelius at the (laughs) peninsula club (laughs) actually i got married in davidson at at the davidson college oh that's cool it's beautiful there yeah we had a lovely uh lovely ceremony and all of our family was there and then we went off to our honeymoon, and I think we went to... Talladega. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got married in November, so we, we had a nice trip to uh, somewhere tropical. Oh, I don't cool. remember. That's probably why I'm not married anymore. We, will, we went to Paris on See, our honeymoon. I, I, I don't know where I went. I went to Turks and Caicos <laughs> there you or go. Bermuda. I don't know. Well, you went to... to 
Italy and well, Rome. Paris. And, and so Paris. I would actually recommend, like, I, I think it was hard doing um, a honeymoon in Paris, somewhere where you feel like you have to go sightseeing because you're exhausted, right? Mm-hmm. You've just hosted this huge party, and all you want to do is lay on the beach and, and have some yeah. beverages. And Paris, I think, was really tough for us because you did feel like you had to get up and go see this, and you had to see that, and all we wanted to do was, like, lay around. I went to the Virgin Islands. The Virgin, well, they're beautiful. The British Virgin Islands or the U.S. Virgin? BVI. Oh, so I love it yes. down there. We had a great trip. I so now you have twins, two of them? Yes, that would be twins, yes. Uh, both of them are <laughs> twins? <laughs> Identical twin boys. They're nine years old. It's crazy. You know, uh, it goes by uh, so fast. That's, that's, like, that's what I want to ask you about. I mean, we'll get into your Ironman, and I know how much you train, how hard you work, your your job with, with Fox, um, covering NASCAR, and obviously on the sideline of football games. To me, if I just – if someone told me that, I would say, well, how does that, how does she do it? Mm-hmm. How do you do it? How do you, how do you balance your family and your husband and, and NASCAR and football and, and, and extensive training? I mean, you're training for a, for an Ironman. That's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I have to, right? Because, um, so I think a lot of this, honestly, Michael, stemmed from being in New York during September 11th. And I've, I've told this story before uh, that the impact that that moment and, and that event had on me was realizing how many people put things off for another day or another week. Then they walked into that building to go to work that day and didn't come back. So I think the impact it had on me was that I'm never going to put something off for something else. And so if you want it all, you have to do it all, right? And I wanted kids, and I wanted a career, and I want to do more than just work and, and be a mom. I, actually, the Iron Man stuff is is sort of what fills my cup. I talk to moms all the time, right, that say that they are constantly filling other people's cups. And what is it that kind of does it for them? And, and that's what does it for me. It's really important. I don't do it because I want to. I do it because I have to. It sort of kind of keeps me balanced. And, I mean, growing up when I was a kid, I had very – I had zero guidance, zero. I grew up in a single-family home with a mom that worked three jobs in the 90s. You know, we walked home and put our – you know, we, we had a Nintendo for our babysitter. We had zero guidance. We got in a lot of trouble, and I feel like – like the Ironman and triathlons are what keep me on a straight path. It's the the structure that I need in my life at this point. You know, as crazy as different as we are, it's my story's a lot the same. I was a race car driver, and I wanted to be the best race car driver I could be. In order to be that race car driver, I started running because I knew that that was time for me to focus on my right. job. It was time for me to say, I'm getting, I'm getting better. I'm, I'm going to be a better racer because of what I'm doing. And it started out literally, me and a buddy ran one mile out and, and back. And, and a year later, we ran our first marathon. And I ran, I ran four of those simply because of what you're saying. But don't you think it gave you structure as well? It exactly. gave you, like, I have to get up tomorrow morning and I have to put in these miles. So I'm not going to go out with my buddies tonight. I'm not going to stay up past, like, whatever time. Like, I have to be responsible within that those parameters. And, and I, I feel like that does it for me. I, I love that. And that's exactly what I used running for mm-hmm. when I was training and, and racing. And so I appreciate that. And I understand it, crazy enough, that, that that's where you are. But tell me about training. Mm-hmm. You talked about getting up at 5 or six in the morning to, to what are you going to do? Yeah, I was up at 4.30 this morning, actually, to get on my Peloton bike because I knew that my day was so busy. And if I didn't get up and I didn't get it in, then I wouldn't have time. And that's just what it is, right? It's it's getting up. It's getting up to run. Uh, sometimes, obviously, it's hard. I, I get a little nervous being a woman, you know, going out at 4 a.m., running so yeah, i'll have just to... coming home you know yeah, i know i know or riding your bike i tell people all the time like they're like ride on saturday mornings like I, i'll go out really early on a saturday morning i don't mind getting out there at like four o'clock in the morning i'm lit up i have plenty of stuff but then you, you do when you see that random car you're like all right where are they coming from right um but you uh hope they're going to not yes coming from. Co- going to church i hope they're going to church <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I, I just, I do it, right? I, I, I find the time and I do it. And, um, yeah, it, it's self-discipline at the, at the, at the most extreme level. And, and so let's, let's talk about discipline. You have to be prepared to do the hub mm-hmm. every day with Adam. And there's very smart, relevant folks that come on to, to the hub and they have intimate knowledge about what happened over the weekend. You obviously have to be well-versed in, in their world as well. How? Uh, let's just take that piece of the puzzle first. We get up at four thirty and we run, and maybe get home in time to take the kids to school, or at mm-hmm. least make them breakfast. 
then then do we study or how how did we get ready for this uh, this job that you have with Fox? Well, I think I mean you you can relate, right? You've been in this industry for a really long time. When you're in NASCAR, you live it. You're part of the lifestyle of NASCAR, so you're constantly around the storylines. You're constantly, I mean, every weekend at the track. I mean, I spent, you know, 10 years at the racetrack there Friday through Sunday. There were weekends where I would interview drivers and see them more than I saw my husband that entire week. And so you're constantly just around it. I feel like NASCAR is a little easier to cover because of that, because you're so embedded with the sport. When I go and do NFL, you know, and say I have to cover the Bears and it's week eight and I haven't seen them all season long – And, yeah, you kind of know what's going on and you know the key players, but you certainly don't know the inner workings of what's been going on within that organization. And so I find those to be a little bit more um, strenuous in terms of studying. Uh, Same with when I'll jump in to do college basketball. I did one college basketball game this year, like one Villanova game. I I hadn't seen them in a year. Yeah. And so you have to be prepared, and and it is about managing your time. But you you can get this, right? So you're the race car driver. You're the face of – that team, but you know that there's a, there are a lot of people that are working a hell of a lot harder every single day, whether it be 15, 16, 17 hours to get that car out on the racetrack. And I want to do my role to, to, to make sure that those people don't think what the, all that hard work was in vain. Yeah. And you can understand that, can't you? Oh, certainly. You want to make sure that, that you, it's so crazy to try to explain to fans what all goes into this and, and the countless, endless hours of of prep on the car Mm -hmm. and and the individuals that make that car go fast you know it's it's kevin harvick behind the wheel and there's literally hundreds of people that that are tuning on that car to make that happen and so to have an appreciation for that and try to explain that to the folks at home it's interesting because if you think about nascar you basically got 40 guys that you got to figure out um on the track on the on the weekend but and so i think of that as being fairly simple but then you talk about doing Villanova basketball game that you hadn't seen in a while, and they're playing, you know, whoever they're playing, Georgetown or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now you're you're up to 24, 25 people that, mm-hmm. that you really haven't seen much of. Mm-hmm. To to me, you, we see the same guys every week. That's pretty that's pretty easy. But to be versatile enough to appreciate all the folks that support the players on the court or the drivers on in the car, and then be able to 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 expand your knowledge about yeah. everything that goes into it that's pretty impressive it's about relationships i mean it, from day number one when i stepped foot into the nascar garage back in 2007 when i knew this many people you know i knew marty smith and he he and i got hired at espn at the same time and i give him a, I, I give him a lot of credit because he did take me under his wing introduced me to a lot of people and i think people were a little more patient with me because they knew i was friends with him And I stayed in the garage late, and I asked crew chiefs if I could come and ask them a question about camber or, you know, track bars or cowls or whatever, because I didn't know the answers to those things. And I feel like those relationships, whether it be in NASCAR or in in college football and college basketball, I will go to as many practices as a coach will let me go to, because I want to show that coach that I have as much respect for his program as he does. I'm not just going to show up and, and mail it in. I'm going to put in the time. And I really think over the years, that's gone farther than any kind of prep that I can do in reading stats is just building those relationships in that respect. I mean, it's a chance for for me to do prep Mm -hmm. at six o'clock on Monday night. If I'm not on the show, I'm watching the show. And the, 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 the players, the folks that that were a part of the drama that played out on the racetrack are right there telling you what happened. There's no show like it. There's no show in the NFL that has Tom Brady on the show, you know, like a Chad Knauss when he was when he was winning, or or like Joey Logano. He's fresh off victory lane. He comes on the show on Monday or Tuesday. There's nothing like it. And to me, there isn't. And it's Mm-mm. the perfect opportunity for me to spend an hour a day and and find out what's going on in my world and and to to be more knowledgeable as a as an insider. Can you imagine what that means to the fans? If if I'm watching and I'm learning, that that's that's so great that that the hub is there and you guys host it and welcome in the stars of our sport and get the stories. And that's what's so cool. I mean, I love watching you and have great respect for what you've done over the years because you 
have been in this sport for so long, but you're constantly still growing and constantly trying to improve what you do every single weekend, whether it be in the booth or on Hub. And that's, I mean, again, I think you recognize, like people recognize when people work hard. And they also recognize when people don't work hard. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I have a great deal of respect for you because of just how hard you work. I mean, people see you on the grid walk, right? And they don't realize that that's just like that's a part of what you do. Like what you do, your knowledge and, and your just continuing knowledge of, of growing of the sport is pretty incredible. You know what? I, I love the grid walk because it gives me a chance to to go down on the on the pit road and, and before the cameras come on say, Hey Bubba, do you mind if I talk to you about your nephew and mm-hmm. or and I find William Byron and say, Is your dad here? You know, those things that's and that, only you can do that, by the way. Like, well, like if one of us tried to do that and tried to be like this goofy character running up to drivers right before they got in the car, it wouldn't work. And so, I mean, it it works because it's you. Well, it's 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 certainly a lot of fun. Tell me about um, your daily um, schedule once you get done running at four thirty in the morning, and and I guess I'm basically asking what when do you get to Fox and and what all goes into getting here for that. Six to seven. You don't show up at 530, I know. Yeah, no, I do get my kids up. So my kids get up about 6.30 every morning. I get them up and I get them out the door. A lot of times my husband will drive them to school just because it's on the way to his work. Uh, so, But I do get them up and get them fed and, and all of that stuff and get them out the door. Um, and then, you know, I take some time for myself, whether I have to do doctor's appointments or if I have to do something for myself, like personally. Uh, today I took my car to get an oil change and, and had to do some random things. Or sometimes I'll wait till after the boys are out the door to go for my run or to go and do something. Uh, and then we get here about noon. A lot of times I'll get here a little bit earlier, about 11.15, 11.30. I like to kind of get settled. Um, if I want to read over the quote sheets from from Sunday or if I if I want to do just some like searches about specific things, start to prep for the weekend, I can do that. We have a meeting from noon to one and then I usually get in makeup at 1.30. With our new digital set, we actually have to pre-produce some things, yeah. uh, just some things. And so we a lot of times have to be on set at 3.45, which is pretty early. It wasn't that early in our old studio. So I'm in makeup up at 1.30, usually done by 3.15 and on set by 3.45. I have a little bit of time after we pre-produce those things before the 5 o'clock uh, rehearsal because we do start rehearsing at 5 that I can kind of do some things that I need to do. But I'm like, I mean, I'm, I'm also like, you know, I'm scheduling lunches for the kids. I'm booking doctor's appointments for the kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm right now organizing camps, summer camps for the kids, um, scheduling babysitters. Like I, I'm not just here. Like there's a lot of other yeah. things. I'm mommy, right? Right. Like <laughs> – so mommy's their mommy's their, busy. their role is is pretty extensive. And let's just take today for example. We had an an awesome All Star Saturday night. Mm-hmm. We did the the opens finishes were everything you hoped for, and then the way those boys raced in in the All Star race. Uh, what what was your takeaway as a reporter on what you saw Saturday night? I think it was. I thought it was a great race. I. I have said a million times that I felt like last year was lightning in a bottle because it was so amazing. And I feel like this year lived up to it. I um, really, really am am drawn to the stories of the open though. And I know that there's, you know, some drivers that are like, "Eh, we shouldn't be doing the open, you know, it should just be the all-stars. But I think for a guy like, I mean, look, Bubba, for him to get into that, to that race, amazing. Right, because you know what he's been going through, and you know you know how hard that yeah. is, right? And yeah. and for him to have this little shot in the arm and this little validation, great. William Byron, right? You don't think you know, Chad Knauss didn't want to be in that open, you know? He's been in the All Star race, you know, eighteen years in a row. You know, I'm sure it was hard for him to have to set that car up for that open, and then he was able to get in. Kyle Larson, you know, a guy who has second place finishes, and we talk all the time about these missed opportunities, and for him to go and capitalize on the opportunity, it was pretty incredible. It was an incredible night, I think. I I think it's great momentum for the 600. I do, too. And you know what I take out of it most is that, you know, Larson obviously wins the the million-dollar check and the big night for him. But but he knows he knows he's got it. He knows he's good. He's yeah. gonna win. My my favorite thing about Saturday night was Bubba yeah. because he had been challenged so much with the way the car had performed and and the lack of results. And then not only to drive that car on old tires and mm-hmm. and get that win in that stage, but then top five in the All Star race. That has to make him. I bet he's walking around with a real real skip in his step this week, knowing what he accomplished and knowing. 
that that's the those are the best guys. He he beat yeah. you know he beat most of the best on Saturday night, and that's got to be a good sign for him and that team. But not only that, I mean, also with the way that the first stage ended, right? Getting beat, yeah. Like you could tuck your tail and and go hide, right? Your car's got a little damage. You just got flat out beat. You could get discouraged, and he didn't. And I mean, the Kyle Larson thing, like you said, he knows he's going to win. Isn't I mean after a while though of not winning and people telling you that you should and not winning I mean that's gotta that's gotta wear on a guy a little bit right well, well, I mean it, but do do we give Jeff Gordon the credit he took him to that to that yeah I know soothsayer <laughs> or that place is gonna be the biggest busiest fortune. place in Dover when <laughs> we go back he has been on it ever since they left there <laughs> every driver in NASCAR is going to make a stop at that place on the way to Dover <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question I'm gonna preview the 600 from my eyes I don't see it looking much different mm. than the All Star race I think those changes to the cars were minimal uh, I think the 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 rules that we raced with in the 2019 cars. At Kansas, it's, it's they're going to be the same. The only thing I'm worried about is being able to run wide open and run that close together because of the temperature. It's definitely going to be slippery and hot when they start. Does the does the sun setting make the track get better and the cars race closer together? What are you looking to see? And, and another thing, I, I listened to Sirius XM this week, and Todd Gordon was on there, and he's like, "There's there's there's four races Sunday night." We got 400 it. lappers, you know, because mm-hmm. we we have to have those stage points, and we have to we can't wait for our car to come to us. We have to be adjustable and ready to race from the time they say go. And with the dominating performance we saw from Truex three years ago, mm-hmm. and and then what Kyle did last year, mm-hmm. then stick stick in between those two races, Austin Dillon leading what two laps? Yes, and the we, end. What what do you expect? I don't think there's anything that history tells us we can't expect. What do you think we'll see? Yeah, I think with the 600, I I think you have to realize that it is a 600-mile race, right? And I feel like when you come off of something like the All-Star, where every lap is like hold your breath, hold on because of the format, I think the all the 600, I mean, it's attrition, right? It's it's a marathon. Like when you start off in your marathon, yeah, when you start off in your marathon, you're not blazing a trail at mile seven. You know, it's who can survive. And it's about the process. And there's going to be so many story changes and there's going to be so many storylines. And then maybe it does come down to a fuel mileage situation at the end. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe we do have a guy run away with it. But I mean, I feel like over the past, this season, there's really, I mean, with the exception of maybe Martinsville, right, where just Brad Kislev was the class of the field like even when you have a Kyle Busch or a Kevin Harvick who have the best car something's been happening during mm. that race that changes the whole complexity of the race and so I don't think you can certain certainly can't I think try to guess what's going to happen in a 600 mile race just like you can't guess what's going to happen when you run 26.2 it's the longest race of the season it's actually I haven't worked one in a really really long time um, and we'll be here obviously but I just uh, it's a long yeah. night I think that's – I think I I will predict from what I saw in the All-Star and, and what I saw at Kansas, this it th- there won't be a dominating car. You don't think so? Sunday night. I think it's going to be very competitive. And the finishes are usually dictated by when the last caution flies. You know, if, you have, a caution, if you have a caution with 10 to go, there's going to be people that don't pit, do pit. You're going to have craziness. <laughs> I just feel like we're going to see a really competitive, interesting 600 – because you think there'll be a lot of passing? I think so. Really? And I believe that for a couple of reasons. I saw a lot of speed from from uh, Joe Gibbs Racing, particularly Kyle. But also you saw how fast Kevin was and, and Clint was on the pole. So those those two organizations. Um, and, I mean, and Hendrick, I mean, at Kansas, right? I mean, yeah. how do you – I know Kansas is a different kind of animal, it's, right? It's not, I don't know. I don't think it's that different. Just I think, wider. Yeah, and... I think, I think – I'm, I'm thinking because of what I saw at Kansas. Yeah. I'm optimistic that's what I'm going to see. I feel like the, the, that we knew coming into this season, right, there were going to be some teams that just really hit on this package. And I feel like Joe Gibbs Racing and Penske did that. Yeah. But I feel like Stuart Haas Racing and Hendrick Motorsports are absolutely catching up. And how cool would it be to maybe see, like, Alex Bowman uh, break through and get that win, you know, because he's been so close. And Or Jimmy, right? I mean, I've been uh, picking that's, Jimmy. Like, that's where I was going to go. Every week I yeah. pick Jimmy. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I love Jimmy Johnson, and I, and I know y'all – Y'all have a lot in common. He just finished the Boston yeah, Marathon. as well as you. You did yeah, Boston. I, I did that 100 years ago. But uh, he's also a triathlete. Mm-hmm. And you've got a you've got a big event coming up. We're we're gonna 
We're going to run the marathon of NASCAR, mm -hmm. the Coca-Cola 600 this Sunday. And we know what a challenge that is physically for the drivers with totally. the heat and the focus that they have to have. You're training for something equally as impressive. Thanks. Yeah, I, I got uh, two half Ironmans this year, so I'm going to do one in July. Does that make it whole or not? It doesn't. Mm -hmm. I wish. I, I trained for a full one last year, and I was two weeks away from the event when Hurricane Michael hit the area and just just destroyed Panama City. So they had to cancel the event. And, and again, like w another reason why I really enjoy doing this is because I do feel like it helps me relate to the athletes that I cover, mm -hmm. right? Because – I know what it feels like to be ready for an event, maybe like you guys, right? Like you go out there, you practice all weekend, you do the whole thing, and then like lap one, you get in a wreck. I know what that disappointment's like to not be able to really kind of show what you are capable of, what you've trained for, what you've prepared for. Um, I also know what it's like to deal with injuries. I know what it's like to be in the zone because all those things I kind of I deal with. And so I feel like it, it helps me kind of relate to whether it be NFL players or NASCAR players. Uh, but I do have two 70.3s this year that I'm doing, and I'm also raising some money for the Ironman Foundation. And people always say, what's the Ironman Foundation? Well, we go into these racing communities where we race, and we give back to these communities. So Panama City, we'll go in and we'll build homes for people who lost their homes in the hurricane. We did that in Santa Rosa, which is in Northern California last year. We built homes for people that lost their homes in the wildfires. We teach kids who have disabilities how to surf. We build bikes for inner city kids. So there's a service project in about, I think I would say we do about eight to nine a year. And then we also, we give money to the nonprofits in those racing mm -hmm. communities. And so this is the second year in a row that I've done this auction because I thought rather than just begging people for money, I can reach out to people like you, right? People that I know in sports and ask them for an autograph, ask them for something that I can then sell and I can raise money. And uh, I have 50, 50 something items donated to me this year. Wow. Yeah. Last year I had like 20 something. And so it's, um, my goal is $20,000. I raised 14 last year. So I'm hoping to hit the 20,000 mark. And, uh, yeah, you were nice enough to donate a book that I'm going to actually, I'm going to put on the eBay auction today as this runs. I, I didn't want to release everything at one time because I was afraid I would, you know, saturate the market. I actually had a pair of, I have a pair of Clint Boyer's gloves that are now up to $1,600. Are they the ones he punched no. with? No. <laughs> I wish. Wouldn't that be awesome? They'd probably be worth a lot more. But as soon as like this weekend happened, I was like, yes, <laughs> more money for the foundation. Yeah, so, the, yeah. The foundation is an is an awesome cause that you're able to 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 affect and help folks that Thanks. in the areas where you travel. It's um so it's the Iron Man folks, Michael. Like um the people that I've met along the way are so inspiring to me, and it's not just the uh, the elite athletes because obviously what they do is incredible. I use this buddy, my buddy Mike Ergo. I use him as an example all the time. So he is a Marine, lost like 25 of his his soldiers in the Battle of Fallujah, had extreme PTSD when he came back and found triathlon and Ironman. He runs either the half or the full part of the run carrying a flag. I mean, like a huge flag on a flagpole. And then he gives that flag to a Gold Star family as he crosses the finish line. I I've met the Peace Brothers who live in Atlanta, the Atlanta area. Uh, one of them is quadriplegic in a wheelchair. And his brother drags him in a little boat, rides with him on a double bicycle, and then runs with him in a specially designed uh, like a, a wheelchair. And so I sit here and I go, I'm tired. It's 4.30 in the morning. And then I realize these amazing human beings and, and the perseverance and the heart, yeah, heart. Uh, that they have. And that's what inspires me. So for me to be able to be part of this, I feel like I'm not worthy to be part of it because – the incredible stories that these people and what they've had to overcome. I don't, I, and I'm not saying like I have none of that. So I do what I can. I, I host a banquet every every year, and I get to sit up on stage and interview some of these people and help them tell their stories. And I walk out of that event, and my heart is full. Yes. And that's like that's why I do it. Like that's why I'm so passionate about it. Uh, it's um, we all work, right? We're parents. We work. What do we do for us? What do we feel do to fill our cup? And and that this is what I do. Well, my heart's full right now listening <laughs> to that story. It's so so sweet, and and you know you see pictures of of guys pushing their their brother or their cousin or their yeah. uncle in a in a wheelchair, and the pictures, you know, they they're they're meaningful. But to hear you tell the story of of 
of knowing people yeah. that do this and why they do it. It's very touching. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm very blessed to, to be, I'm very blessed to have found it. And so I, again, I, I do what I can. And I mean, this auction is a lot of work, right? I'm doing two or three interviews every single day, radio interviews. Uh, you know, I'm constantly responding to people who are asking questions. I had to reach out to everybody to get all of these items. It is a lot of work, but it is worth it to me because I can get back to the foundation and, and I can get back to something that means a lot to me. Well, I, I really appreciate you sharing it. Of course. And, and Thanks your, for having me on. <laughs> how do how do we specifically tell people to, to go, I'm going to go bid on Boyer's Gloves for sure. And, <laughs> There's uh, a lot of stuff on there. I have Jimmy Johnson shoes. Your brother, Van Colley, just sent me uh, one of Daryl's uh, helmets, this really cool poster of one of his wrecks that's signed in the car. I don't even – I mean, you would probably know yeah, where it was. That the car's like – is that where it was? The car was like – Or Daytona. I mean, the car is literally coming apart. Right. I'd have to show you. I could show you on my phone. And then um, he also gave me a die cast, like a, a Mercury from I, – I don't even know what year it yeah, is here. Yeah, 75. I can, is that what it was? Yeah, here, let me see. 95. Let me see. It's on my phone here. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yes. Yeah, so it's the not yet is a number ninety five. Um, Terminal transport seventy one Mercury Cyclone. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So Who I have that sign. And then this picture is that Pocono? No, that's that's Daytona. That's Daytona. I think. Yeah. So it's um. I'm yeah. crazy about a Mercury. Yeah, so those things will be up soon. And, and so, like I said, I have signed shoes and I have you signed gloves. Book. I have your book. Yes, I have your book. I have a Dale Earnhardt book. Oh. Dale Earnhardt Jr. signed a book. Um, I have reached out, reached out to Mike Davis, and, and he sent me that. I also have a die cast from Jr. that I'll release and um, got some Cars 3 stuff and Shannon football stuff. Spoke. Football stuff. I have NFL stuff, too. It's not just NASCAR. College basketball. I have Kentucky. I'm John glad. Calipari signed I basketball. John Calipari. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you about. How did you get to be Shannon Spoke? That's how. And what did your cool. kids think about that? They thought it was really cool. Yeah, they you're, could care you're less. a movie star, right? They could care less about anything else I do. But when I'm in Cars Three, yeah, yeah. that was pretty cool. Uh, they called me up. They called me up, and actually, they they tweeted me. They reached out to me on Twitter, direct messaged me, and said, "Hey, our boss would like to talk to you about um, a role in in Cars 3. And I was like, "On the phone with them." <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they well, they finally, said finally something yeah. good comes from Twitter. <laughs> there, yeah, <laughs> it's taking all this time. <laughs> so I want I'm asking again because I don't I want you to say it. How do you log on? Where do you yep. go to your to, to, to bid on these items because I want to write it down. So you go to eBay. And so if you just go to eBay.com and go into the eBay search engine, you can put Shannon Spake and those items will come up. But the uh, direct link is eBay.com backslash USR backslash Spakers. So, there yeah. There you go. All the items are there, including well, your book. I'm thankful that you included me in your auction. Well, I thank you for, for donating it. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, and it's it awesome. means a lot to me that you shared your story today on, on my podcast. And, if you would like to sign up and register and listen to my podcast, I've done. You can go to your done. favorite podcast app. You know, I listen to podcasts when I'm running and riding. That's all I listen to. So, well, I'm I gonna have to do that. it. I'm I'm thankful and I'm happy you came. So, so that wasn't that scary, right? Which part? You said that you were a little nervous when we first started. Were you just Were you just blowing smoke? No, like <laughs> you can say I'm almost crying listening to those stories about you know about. About those soldiers, the, yeah. the the heroes of this country, Memorial Day weekend. I mean, I don't see how we can't really blow out raising a lot of money on your on your auction so. because I mean, this is all about patriotism mm -hmm. this weekend, and and uh, you touched my heart. I appreciate that. Oh. Well, we'll have to get you out to a race, and I'll be able to introduce you to some of some of the people that I've met. You'd yeah. really enjoy that. Yeah, the, the Peace Brothers. They are huge sports fans, and uh, and they definitely know who you are. So maybe when we're in Atlanta, yeah. we'll get them out there. I'll definitely come to the end. <laughs> the end of the race, <laughs> yes. right. Yeah, that's yes. the best part, right? right. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon. Of course. Wow. I am inspired. I just love Shannon Spake. I love who she is and all that she has going on and her stories of the folks that compete and, and the, the, the commitment that people make to uh, be a part of the Ironman community. It's, and then the, the giving, her auction. Please, please go on eBay and search Shannon Spake and buy some items. Get those gloves. You can tell people those are the ones Clint was punching with on Saturday night. Or you can buy my book. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much again for watching, listening to Wall Trip Unfiltered. 
Please tell your friends to go to their favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and um, sign up and listen to us next week. We're going to have another great show. It's been so much fun getting to know people inside of NASCAR. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have.